In 1462, a scholar in Florence named Marsilio Ficino was busy translating the works of Plato from Greek into Latin. He was about to make the wisdom of Plato, lost for many centuries, once more available to scholars and philosophers in the West. However, he was suddenly interrupted in his task by the man who gave him that task in the first place, Cosimo de' Medici, the wealthy banker, and for the previous three decades, the de facto ruler of Florence. Cosimo was eager to read Plato's works. As well as a hard-headed businessman and politician, he was a bit of an intellectual, someone who was interested in philosophy and the ancient world. In fact, one of his friends said he was never happier than when he was reading philosophical treatises. Like most educated people of his day, he could read Latin, but not Greek, or at least not much Greek. And so he needed Ficino, a brilliant linguist, to translate Plato for him. And he wanted it in a hurry. He was now in his early 70s, in poor health, and all too aware that his days were numbered. He'd owned the complete manuscript of Plato's writings for more than 20 years, hanging on to it until he could find the right translator who turned out to be Ficino. However, no sooner had Ficino begun translating Plato than Cosimo suddenly did a switcheroo. He gave him a different Greek manuscript to translate first, one he had acquired much more recently. This manuscript had been discovered in a monastery in Macedonia by one of the manuscript hunters whom Cosimo sent out like Indiana Joneses to search for long lost works of ancient wisdom in musty libraries. The manuscript discovered in Macedonia was written in Greek, but the manuscript contained, Cosimo believed, the ancient wisdom of the Egyptians. Cosimo wanted to read this manuscript before Plato because he knew, or at least thought, that its wisdom was older than Plato's, and that Plato had gained much of his knowledge from the mystical writings of its author. Cosimo therefore wanted to begin at the beginning, to trace knowledge back to its earliest manifestation. This was, of course, the great compulsion of scholars in the 1400s, who had the rallying cry, ad fontes, or back to the sources, usually Greek and Roman ones, but in this case, Egyptian. And so it was this Greek manuscript that Ficino was suddenly compelled by Cosimo to translate. It was a manuscript, Ficino quickly realized, that contained, as he wrote, all precepts of life, all principles of nature, all mysteries of theology. He was soon as excited as Cosimo, and its wisdom, once revealed to the world, would go on over the next few centuries to have a legacy as rich and important as Plato's. Hello and welcome. I'm Ross King, and this is Renaissance Discoveries, where we go back in time to look at the discoveries and rediscoveries made by Italian scholars and artists of the 1400s. In other videos, we look at how works of ancient writers such as Quintilian and Plato were rediscovered in the West, or how the Kabbalah entered Christian culture and thought thanks to Pico della Mirandola. In keeping with this noble tradition, in this video, we're going to look at the rediscovery in the 1400s of the Corpus Hermeticum, the Hermetic texts, the mystical writings, in other words, of the ancient Egyptian sage, Hermes Trismegistus. We need to start with some mythology and genealogy. When the Greeks arrived in Egypt following the conquests of Alexander the Great in 332 BC, they took over many of the Egyptian deities, or absorbed them, we might say, into their own collection of gods. One Egyptian god that particularly interested them was Toth, who was often depicted as a man with the head of an ibis. Toth was what we might call the god of scholarship and learning. His brief basically included reading, writing, and arithmetic. In the Phaedrus, Plato wrote, he it was who invented numbers and arithmetic and geometry and astronomy, also drafts and dice, and most important of all, letters. In other words, 
hieroglyphics. All of this sounded familiar to the Greeks who decided that Toth must be the same guy as their god Hermes, who invented the alphabet, drafts and dice, musical instruments such as the lyre, and acted as the god of languages. Hermes Trismegistus was a kind of fusion or cross-cultural mashup of the Greek Hermes and the Egyptian Toth. Trismegistus means thrice greatest, and he got this title because he was supposedly the greatest king, the greatest philosopher, and the greatest priest. He combined, therefore, political leadership with wisdom and spiritual authority. The name Hermes Trismegistus was known to scholars and theologians in the West. According to St. Augustine, writing around 400 AD, he was a wise man of stupendous antiquity, someone who lived long before the sages and philosophers of Greece, long before guys like Plato and Aristotle. In fact, he supposedly lived in Egypt around the time of Moses, that is, the 13th or 14th century BC, so some 900 years before Plato and roughly around the time of King Tut. Hermes Trismegistus became synonymous with ancient wisdom and learning. The early Christian theologian Clement of Alexandria claimed he wrote 42 sacred books that contained all the world's knowledge, everything from books on astrology and the geology of the Nile to the maladies of women. A century or so later, the pagan philosopher Iamblichus added a few more books to his name, saying he wrote 36,525 of them. Not bad going. So Hermes Thrice Greatest was an ancient wise man, a sage, an encyclopedia or search engine in the form of a god. We learn from one of the Hermetic texts, one of these manuscripts discovered in Macedonia in 1460, that he studied under or had revelations from a being known as Poimandres or Pymander. Poimandres is, by his own account, an intelligence of supreme authority. I know what you want, he says, and I am with you wherever you are. And he gives Hermes a series of visions and revelations in answer to Hermes' plea that he wants to learn the things that are and comprehend their nature and know God. What the Hermetic texts purport to give, therefore, are the answers to life, the universe, and everything. They're a rich compendium of astrology, botany, mathematics, medicine, theology, mysticism, and even, as we'll see, plain old magic. Their wisdom was believed to have been passed down the centuries to such intellectual heavyweights as Orpheus, Pythagoras, and Plato, an unbroken chain of divine wisdom anchored way back in the mists of time by Hermes Trismegistus himself. In my video on the Kabbalah, I talk about how Plato was believed by many to have studied with Jewish scholars, but he was also supposedly influenced by the ancient Egyptians. He'd gone to Egypt to learn from Egyptian holy men, studying for 13 years in Heliopolis and funding his lessons, according to Plutarch, by selling oil to the Egyptians. His works, therefore, contain echoes of the ancient wisdom and revelations of Hermes and Poimandres that he learned in Heliopolis. So we can see why Cosimo de' Medici should have been so excited about his latest find. He had in his possession waters from the same fount of knowledge from which Plato himself had drunk. This is, to repeat, a typically Renaissance gesture, to want to go back to the earliest and most original sources in a kind of intellectual archaeology, an onion skin peeling or reverse engineering of all knowledge. Before ancient Greece, there had been ancient Egypt, and so it was the words of this Egyptian wise man that Cosimo was desperate to read. The man charged with translating Hermes Trismegistus into Latin was Marsilio Ficino, whom I also talk about in my Plato video, which I can't recommend too highly. Ficino was a true Renaissance man, a doctor, a poet, a linguist, an astrologer, a mathematician, a botanist, 
and he was also a musician and singer. He believed music could banish melancholy, something from which he himself suffered, and his public performances in which he strummed the lyre and chanted verses soon became legendary. He was the Jimi Hendrix of the Orphic Lyre, working himself into a frenzy as he played and singing hymns in a voice that could enchant African lions and move mountains in the Caucasus, or so one of his listeners claimed. Pacino's main claim to fame in the early 1460s was his knowledge of Greek, and this is the reason that Cosimo put him to work, first on Plato and then interrupting that on the Hermetic texts. Ficino translated the Hermetic texts within the space of a year, finishing his labors in the spring of 1463 and dedicating the work to Cosimo. He gave it the resonant title, a book on the power and wisdom of God, whose title is Pimander. Cosimo paid Ficino for his labors by giving him a little property at Careggi, just outside Florence, near to where Cosimo had his own somewhat more spacious country villa. We don't know what exactly Cosimo made of the Hermetic texts. He immediately put Ficino back to work translating Plato, and it was these translations that Ficino was reading aloud to Cosimo when he died at his place in Careggi two years later on August 1st, 1464. However, the Hermetic texts had a huge effect on Ficino and on lots of those who followed him. First of all, Ficino saw a Christian overlay or undercurrent to the Hermetic texts, which he believed revealed Christian truths and constituted a kind of pagan gospel, the gospel according to Saint Trismegistus, we might say. He claimed that the Hermetic text showed that Hermes, some 15 centuries before the birth of Christ, foresaw the birth of Christ, as well as the resurrection and the last judgment. Indeed, the spiritual orthodoxy of the Corpus Hermeticum appeared to be confirmed by the fact that many of its phrases and doctrines, such as its account of creation and the description of baptism, could be found in the Bible. Hermes therefore seemed to be a prophet who foresaw the coming of Christ and the rise of Christianity, something that pleased Ficino and others who followed him because it showed the basic piety of the pagan philosophers men in whom philosophers of the 1400s, such as Ficino, were greatly interested. And it seemed to show how all religions and philosophies shared the same basic views and beliefs. I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but something else about these writings struck Ficino, that is how they described the nature of man's relationship to God. Christianity emphasized the difference between God and man. Even though the first chapter of Genesis declared that God created man in his own image, Christianity, because of the fall of man, opened an unbridgeable gulf between the two. In 1215, the Lateran Council, which was a conference or summit of the Pope with cardinals and bishops, had been explicit. Between the creator and the creature, there cannot be found so great a similarity that there could not be found a greater dissimilarity. However, the Hermetic texts downplayed the dissimilarity, exalting man such that he himself became a kind of God on earth. What a great miracle is man, says Hermes, a being worthy of reverence and honor. For he goes into the nature of a god as though he were himself a god. So were not these pathetic fallen creatures that medieval Christianity banged on about, but rather creatures capable of possessing godlike powers. The Hermetic text gave a kind of rallying cry for the realization of human potentiality. Believe that nothing is impossible for you. Think yourself immortal and capable of understanding all, all arts, all sciences, the nature of every living being. This is stirring stuff. We should all be saying that to ourselves in front of the mirror each morning, believing that we humans have dignity and nobility, that we have powers of investigation and imagination, 
we can peer into the secrets of the universe and raise ourselves to great intellectual and creative heights. If we want to find pivot points in history, those moments where everything changes, we could argue that this is one of them, a transition from an older medieval idea of man as worthless and debased, as fallen and sinful, as described, for example, in a famous work composed in 1195 by a young cardinal named Giovanni Lotario, who three years later became Pope Innocent III. Cardinal Lotario's treatise on the misery of the human condition put forth a bleak view of our life here on earth. Man has been formed of dust, clay, ashes, and a thing far more vile of the filthy sperm, he wrote. And in the end, he says, we are destined to become the food of voracious consuming worms, a putrid mass that eternally emits a most horrible stench. But the Hermetic texts exalted man. They raised him aloft and celebrated his glorious powers of creation and discovery. Now, by the way, I use the masculine terms him and his advisedly, because that's, of course, the way they looked at things back then. Women didn't quite count. And unfortunately, they didn't get the chance to develop their skills and abilities. These ideas of our godlike powers to do anything and everything would be taken up by others, by, for example, a friend of Ficino's named Giovanni Pico, the Prince of Mirandola, who in 1486 would write his Oration on the Dignity of Man, which he begins with a quote from Hermes Trismegistus about the miraculous nature of man. And he goes on to say, riffing on Hermes, a wondrous and unsurpassable felicity of man to whom it is granted to have what he chooses, to be what he wills to be. Shakespeare then riffs on these lines when he has Hamlet say, What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god. But we also find this belief, this self-belief in creative and scientific powers in artists such as Michelangelo, who we might imagine looks at himself in the mirror in the morning. He goes to carve a giant misshapen block of white marble that has defeated everyone else and says, Michelangelo, believe that nothing is impossible for you, and then creates the David. Or in Leonardo da Vinci, when he pours wax through the heart of a bull in order to understand how the heart's valves and ventricles work. Or in Galileo, when he turns his telescope to the heavens and looks at the rough surface of the moon and the blotches on the sun. Or in Leonardo again, when he calculates how the human body, the male body of course, fits into the circle and the square, the two perfect geometrical figures, showing how we humans are geometrically predestined for perfection. <music> Copies of Ficino's translation of the Hermetic text circulated in manuscript in the 1460s, but then in 1471, a copy was printed in Treviso, it was actually a bootleg or pirate edition, we might say, because it was done without Ficino's knowledge or consent. This is a copy that was sold at auction by Christie's in 2018 for almost £70,000. The work would become a bestseller, going through 20 more editions over the next 50 or 60 years, and exciting the imaginations of numerous scholars and writers, and a great many of them were interested not just in mystical teachings of Hermes and how they linked up with Plato and Christianity, but also in the practical magic the books described. One of the treatises, Asclepius, describes how humans can make gods or idols, or what it calls statues and sold and conscious, filled with spirit and doing great deeds, statues that foreknow the future and predict it by lots, by prophecy, by dreams and by many other means, statues that make people ill and cure them, bringing them pain and pleasure as each deserves. <laughs> 
these idols, or what sound a bit like voodoo dolls, are made with what the texts describe as a mixture of plants, stones, and spices. So we have in the Corpus Hermeticum descriptions of magical potions, incantations, and the summoning of spirits, or perhaps demons. This might sound like dangerous territory, and Ficino, who ultimately became a priest, was somewhat discomfited by these descriptions and stuck to emphasizing Hermes as a theologian rather than a magician. Others who followed him had less trouble with these passages, especially the great philosopher of the occult, Cornelius Agrippa, who would lecture on the Hermetic texts at the university in Pavia in northern Italy in 1515. Agrippa would claim that magic, as described in the Hermetic text, was a sublime and sacred science closely linked to religion. The Hermetic texts, like the Kabbalah, were one of the major catalysts for the interest in and practice of natural magic in the decades and centuries that followed, all of which is, of course, another story. All the fun gets spoiled in the 17th century, however, when the truth about the Corpus Hermeticum is finally revealed. Now, I should say that Ficino was absolutely right when he saw expressions and ideas in the Corpus Hermeticum that seemed to share eerie parallels with Christian ideas and expressions. There was a simple reason for these connections, but the relationship was not quite what Ficino believed it was. In fact, it was exactly the opposite as was finally demonstrated in 1614 by the Swiss-born Protestant scholar Isaac Casabon. Casabon, like Ficino, was a great scholar and linguist, but otherwise the pair could not have been more different. Ficino had wished to show the parallels between pagan philosophers and Christianity, how they shared the same essential truths. Casabon, on the other hand, could not accept that God would have revealed his truths to the pagans, to the Egyptians and the Greeks before revealing them to his chosen people. And so he had a kind of vested interest in disproving the authenticity of the Corpus Hermeticum. A few other scholars had already doubted the antiquity of these works, not least because of some glaring anachronism, such as a reference to the Greek sculptor Phidias, who lived in the 5th century BC, in other words, around a thousand years after the books were supposedly written. But it was Casabon who carried out the definitive job of demolition. It was all too easy for him. He was one of the greatest Greek scholars in history. In fact, in about 1600, he was called the most learned man alive. He was a brilliant philologist, the latter-day Lorenzo Valla, someone I talk about in other of my videos. In other words, he understood how language was constructed historically and how, in order to understand the meaning of words and documents, you needed to know their historical context and their evolution through time. Casabon's linguistic skills revealed to him that the Hermetic text could not be nearly as old as Ficino and others believed. The style of this book could not be farther from the language that the Greek contemporaries of Hermes used, he wrote, for the old language had many words, phrases, and a general style very different from that of the later Greeks. Here is no trace of antiquity, no crust, none of that patina of age. On the contrary, there are many words here which do not belong to any Greek earlier than that of the time of Christ's birth. Whoever wrote the Corpus Hermeticum was, Casubon claimed, an imposter who stole the words of the Bible itself, and he called him that false Egyptian Hermes and that fake Mercury. Casubon was right, of course. The texts were not composed some 3,000 years ago by a mysterious Egyptian wise man. Instead, they were the work of groups of scholars and writers working in Egypt in a Greek culture in the centuries after Christ, sometime between the late 1st and late 3rd centuries AD, long after both Plato and Christ. So they neither influenced Plato nor foretold the birth of Christ. They were, rather, 
influenced by Greek philosophy, Christian thought, and Judaism. They were offshoots of these philosophies and relig religions rather than the primordial sources of them. However, they were not the work of imposters. They were probably not deliberate forgeries, but rather the work of writers who hoped to revive ancient Egyptian thought as well as that of Pythagoras and Plato. The result, in other words, of the same sort of ferment of ideas that so inspired the scholars and philosophers of the 1400s. And so it was fitting that these works, the result of cross-cultural mashups and creative interpretations, works that promoted the excellence and dignity of human beings, should have been so enthusiastically embraced by the men who created what we call the Renaissance. It doesn't matter in the end that Hermes Trismegistus was not the ancient sage that Ficino and his contemporaries believed him to be. The important thing is that he spoke to them in a language they were ready and waiting to listen to. He told them what they wanted to hear and needed to know. And so the words of Hermeticism fell into rich soil and produced a remarkable crop. Thank you so much for watching. Please watch more of my videos. Please subscribe to the channel. And please, if you want to know more about Marsilio Ficino and the cross-cultural mashups of the 1400s and how ancient literature fueled the ideas of the Renaissance, please rush out and buy my latest book, available in your favorite bookstore.